Good afternoon, Grade 11s. Today is the 20th of May, and we are going to work through Module 1.4, Software. Okay, let's just get into our slideshow. There we go. So this is page 46 in your study opportunities textbook. I'm going to go through the PowerPoint. This will be done in a series um, of half an hour sessions each. You need to summarize this in your books, please. And then at the end of the activity, you will need to answer the written module activity. Let's just find our cursor. Okay, so let's first take a look at these different types of software. There is um, operating systems, there is application software. Um, so let's take a look at the different types. Okay, so first of all, application software. Application software is the real reason we have computers. The fact that you can buy ready-made software that is powerful and easy to use is why computers are so popular today. And that they are multi-purpose tools. Application software makes computers worth using because it's much easier for people to get the work done and it will increase their productivity. So, Application software programs that perform specific tasks for us as users. There, we are going to look at two different types of application software. The first one is multimedia software and the second one is communication software. So, multimedia software is used to create or view multimedia content. The web has become the way most multimedia is viewed and distributed. As a result, the most popular way of creating multimedia content is using HTML5. And as of this year, we teach you HTML, but we are actually going to start incorporating HTML5 and CSS, which adds the additional features on a website. So as you can say, see the HTML5 icon looks like this. You can download it onto any device. You can put it on your cell phone, your tablet, and there is a very nice website called Solo Learn. Either they've even got an app version that you're able to go and learn HTML and HTML5 by working through their course. Okay, so new types of multimedia products have come out. They are interactive media, multimedia, for example, textbooks created for uses on devices such as the iPad. Now, if you saw a couple of days ago, I let you know that all the study opportunities textbooks are available through Snaplify. So if you have forgotten your textbook somewhere and you need to get the work, you can simply go into the Snaplify app and um, access your study ops textbook. Okay, so it's very nice. I can't remember when last I actually picked up, other than textbooks, picked up a book to read. I read everything off my tablet, off my, or my cell phone nowadays using a, an app. Okay, the next one we're going to take a look at is communications software. Communication software is used to make electronic communication simple, effective, and efficient. So it is used to make um, examples of such programs could be your email programs such as Outlook or Gmail or Hotmail. Um, we have our internet browsers, so Chrome, Internet Explorer, Edge, Firefox, uh, Safari. 
Then we have our instant messaging. So WhatsApp, Telegram, um, Facebook Messenger. Then our social media, which is Facebook. Um, and we also have Skype. Okay, so we've got our email programs, web browsing software, online chat rooms, instant messaging. So online chat room could be something like Skype, um, but the most popular nowadays is WhatsApp that was bought over by Facebook, if you didn't know that. And they are even actually creating a lot of the same um, applications like Zoom and um, Microsoft Teams. Then VoIP, that is your Skype, that stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol. Okay, the next section we're going to focus on is compatibility issues. Now you will say, what does that mean? Quite often I have said to you, when you open a Word document, there will be a yellow bar at the top with a button that says Enable. So the software or the work that you, the data you receive, might have been created in a different Microsoft Office version. But what it enables you, you will still be able to read those documents, even though it might, be, it might have been created in a, say, 2006 version, and you might have a 2019 version. Okay, so let's take a look at reasons. Um, I, before we get to that, I'm just going to say a huge variety of different types of software are available, even to do some basic tasks such as word processing that can have problems with compatibility. Now, the big thing is the newer programs and newer software can open the older software, but the older software will not always be able to open the newer software. A common scenario in the modern work world, person X writes a document and emails it to and with the attachment to person Y. A little while later, person Y responds and says, something is wrong with the file, his word processor won't open it. This kind of problem is a compatibility issue. While both people have word processors, they might have software from different companies or even different versions of the same program. Okay, so every company has a different way to encode data in files. The software expects data to be encoded in a certain way. Now, in most terms, whether you're working in LibreOffice, Google Docs, Microsoft Office, certain features are going to be exactly the same, but there might be here and there a different tweak. If encoding is not what is expected, an error message, or you might actually get a scrambled document. So it will be filled with symbols in, in, in between your data. Okay, so before we get to our solutions, um, I want to just focus on software versions and subscriptions. Let's just see if there is a, no, there isn't a slide for it. Microsoft Office 2003 and Microsoft Office 2016 are simply different versions of the exact same software. To go from one version to the next, the software must be upgraded. So every now and then you've heard about updates but sometimes you need a whole new upgrade with whole new features that have been incorporated. If you have bought software that you can always get the latest version at a discounted price, depending on how old your version is compared to the new version. So a very nice um, software that I actually prefer using is Office 365. I have to pay yearly for it, but I always have the most up-to-date software. An alternative, as I said, is subscribing to Office 365. Um, this means you never own the software. It doesn't fully belong to you like you bought a, um, if you bought Office 2019. You are renting the software. 
Um, on the other hand, the software will always be up to date and the latest version will be installed. Okay, the reason for compatibility issues um, is that every company has a different way of encoding and decoding their data. So let's look at our solutions. I can export my data, so save the document in another format. So how do I do that? I'm going to simply click on Save As, and then I can, under the type, I would then say which version of software. So whether I'm taking the older version, Office 2013. I can also import my data into my software. So import, open with, and open the file in another format. So another place we're going to import this year, you are going to learn access. Now, in your pet, you are going to have to compile your data, capture your data into an Excel spreadsheet. And then we need the same information in your access database. Now, we do not want you to go and retype everything in access. That's going to be a waste of time. There's a lovely little button that says import data, and you can pull your information from your Excel straight into your access database. You can upgrade your software to make sure that you always have the latest version and standardize. Everyone in the organization uses the same version. So in our computer lab, I'm not going to load 2019 on one, 2016 on another one, Office 365 on mine, because that can cause compatibility issues. Okay, software bugs. When the logic decision-making of a program um, causes something to go wrong, people usually refer to it as a computer error. There is really no such thing as a computer error. The computers can only do what you tell them to do. So the error usually happens when people input incorrect data or when programmers make mistakes while they are programming. Okay. so. A software bug is an error in a program caused by the way it was programmed. Most bugs have very little on the average user and may therefore not be noticed for some time. However, sometimes bugs can have serious consequences indeed. Let us take a look. So, um, so there is the, the Falklands War of British ship that was sunk because its computer-controlled missile defense system thought that the missile fired at the ship was friendly. The British weapons included the homing device for that type of missile, and so the software was taught not to think of it as a, th as a threat. So basically, there were two ships. They were at war with each other, but the same software had been installed on both of these ships. And immediately, it saw it as a friendly software, and then it didn't take the threat seriously. Another one is the Mars Climate Orbiter spacecraft crashed because of confusion in the, in the software between the measurements in miles versus meters. Okay, so our metric system. Um, so this was a very expensive lesson which they may have learned. Okay, next part we're going to look at is our tools for combating software bugs. So there are three different ways to do this. I can do testing, error reporting, and keeping software up to date. So let's take a look at what is testing. Testing means I'm going to create a beta version of the software, and I'm going to release this beta version to the public. What the public will then do, or a set number of subscribers, are going to test my software, whether it is a game or a new version of Word, and they're going to try it out. And if they have any complaints, they're going to, or suggestions, they will give this back to the company, and then they will make the amendments. So while the newest one is the newest or latest version is being released, they are already designing the next beta version. So they are constantly looking for new features. Error reporting 
So use error reporting facilities often provided when a program crashes. So your system has suddenly crashed and a little screen is going to pop up and say, would you like to let Microsoft know of the problem? And then you can send them a short message of what happened so that they can see if does this happen regularly or was it a once off problem and how can they try and fix it. Keeping software up to date. Updates contain bug fixes that make software work better. So every single time that an update, so you'll have 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, every time an update comes through, the previous bugs and the three previous errors that were reported will have been fixed and implemented into your system. Okay, now we get on to updating your software. Updating software is the process of get either getting the latest files for the bugs in the current version of the software or obtaining new additional features. Okay, so I can either go and fix the problems that there were or bring in new features. Okay, check the help or about menus. Look um, for the checkup check for updates okay so you can see here learn about them or and at the bottom if you right click on your software it will say check for updates and it will go and look there should be a check for updates menu option if you're connected to the internet the software will find out if it is up to date um, and ask you if there are new features if you would like to install them some software has the option to do this automatically so that you always have the latest updates installed without having to do anything. Okay, now, very, very important. Service packs versus updates. Okay, so you might have heard that your PC will have service pack one or service pack two. It's very different to our updates. A service pack is usually a collection of all the previous for the last period of time, so about six months to a year. Um, the service pack is meant to help people who are behind in their updates uh, to fix all the problems at once. So if your computer says a new service pack is available, it is advisable to install it. So in case you missed any of the updates, what it's going to do, all new updates and features between six months and a year will then be installed at the same time. Where um, a service pack are pretty much the thing of the past. Most software companies expect users to always have internet connection and they create the software so that um, it will regularly or at least once a month update by itself. So take Windows 10. In the past, you could switch off your updates and then keep it until the last day of the month. If you've still got data left, you would update your system. But now, Windows, even if you switch off your updates, it will automatically switch itself back on and install the latest updates. Now, the reason they do this, because if anything goes wrong, legally, they are covered. If you haven't done your updates, there and something goes wrong on your computer, then you cannot take legal action against the company or the software. Okay. The next section is online software. The terms online software or cloud computing and web applications describe a scenario where software actually runs on the server on the internet. You see the interface to the software in the web browser and use the software as if it was on your PC. So basically, let's think of Google Docs or even the online version of Mahala.ms or Office 365. It will look exactly the same as the version that you have on your computer, but it is going to run off a, a server on the internet. Okay, so now there's a couple of advantages and disadvantages. A very good question for the exams. 
Okay, if we're going to start with our advantages, your software is always up to date. You will have the latest features and doesn't matter which device you link or connect to, you will have the latest um, update. You don't have to download or install anything, which means you save space on your hard drive. Um, as I said, it doesn't take space on the local storage. Server CPU could be more powerful than your PC CPU, which means I can run a lot more powerful software on using the um, software from a server than the software on my PC. Use the software and access your data from any computer in the world. So whether it's your cell phone, your tablet, your PC, um, your friend's PC, as long as there's an internet connection, you will be able to access your work or your data. Now, we're going to look at disadvantages. Most importantly, if there's no internet connection, you cannot access your work unless um, Google Docs and Google Sheets have created an offline version that you can install that app onto your device and you will then still be able to access the software. Thirdly, no control over data security or the backup policy. So let's take um, you've, you're using Google Docs and you've got a Google Drive. You are um, subject to Google's data security, which is fortunately one of the best that there is, and they have backups. But if something were to happen to their servers, then your data could be jeopardized. You may need to pay a monthly fee. So in Google Drive, they give you 15 gigs free online storage um, for free. If you wanted more, say for example, you would like um, 100 gigs Google uh, storage on your Google Drive, you would have to pay a percentage like 29 Rand or 30 Rand a month to hire that space. It might lack features or abilities of the desktop software. So the desktop software is always more powerful. Um, so you will see there's some features in the uh, in Google Docs that you that um, sorry there will be some features in Microsoft Word that you would like to use that are not available in Google Docs. And it is going to run as fast as your internet connection. So if you have a slow internet connection, your data and your connection, your software will run slowly. If you have a fast connection, then you have no problems. Okay, so now we're going to take a look more closely at our online software, such as Google Docs. You get Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google, so Google Docs is your Word, Google Sheets is your spreadsheet or Excel, and Google Slides is your PowerPoint or presentation. So, Google Docs is an easy way to try out the idea of online software. Um, this is a free software that gives you access to a web-based word processor, presentation, and spreadsheet application. Okay, the next section that we're going to focus on is exploring our different web applications. The first one here is a blog or a web log. These are both online processing tools. So very, very nice one I have used myself if you want to design a um, website for yourself, a professional website, you could try out WordPress. They've got a bunch of templates on there that will help you set up your website. And all you would need to do is buy a domain through, for example, Access or uh, not Access as in Microsoft Access, if there's a different company Access, but there are multiple, um, there are many, many different domains where you'll be able to buy a space and design your own website. You could also become a blogger. So in the past, they used to say you would be very upset if your parents read your diary 
And nowadays people take their journal, place it online and allow other people to read it. So say for example, you travel and people want to follow where everywhere you are going to travel right across the globe. And every city and town that you go to, you are going to share some of the things that you have learned and seen there. Then there is Squarespace, which is a different um, web log feature. Okay, so they can be used by anyone from an individual who wants to keep an online diary um, that anyone can read to large companies that want to keep people updated on what they are doing. Blogs make money through advertising, but also through sponsorship and subscription. So you can subscribe to some, someone's blog. Blogging software such as Squarespace, Blogger and WordPress are examples of web applications. You will log into a server, create an account for yourself and then use the online tools they provide to design your blog. So you can place images, you can add text boxes, you could have drop down features. There's a variety of things you will be able to do. If you're cu curious about ha how it works, then visit one of these sites, sign up and create your own blog. You'll see that using a blog software turns your browser window into an application like the application you use on your computer. Okay, so let us quickly take a look at what are good practices when blogging. Now, you might actually just an additional thing, if you hear the word vlog, V-L-O-G, that is a video log where you will actually share videos about um, and write things in your videos. Okay, so good practice is update your blog frequently. So it doesn't help that you write in your blog once every six months because people are going to get bored and they're, not, they're going to forget to go and read your blog. Interact with readers, respond to comments. So whenever um, your, you will have a, a response section or a comment section like we've got in Google Classroom, it is important to go and respond to the comments so that the users know or the readers know that you have read their responses. Be casual, informative, and interesting. Okay, very important. Most people, a, a blog, people read a blog the same way they would read a magazine. It's just there, uh, something they do extra. Um, it's because they're interested or that it doesn't have to be very serious. Use catchy titles and graphics. Pictures always draw people. So if you've got a catchy title, um, that will also then they are going to want to find out what exactly is this blog about. Have opinions and express them well. So here you can actually say what you think. Just be aware that um, anything you say or do online, it is out there. So you have to be able to take responsibility for what you are saying. Link to your sources and other sites of interest. So what you could say to them is for example if a town has a website that you you've gone to visit you can add that website onto your blog and people can go and read up more information um, in their own time okay now we're going to quickly look at our advantages and disadvantages of blogging you can share ideas and get feedback Personal and business use, I can use it for advertising and marketing. So I don't just have to have for personal. I can actually, for my business, say I have a, um, I'm a chef and I'd like to share my latest meals and creations. I could actually write a blog on how to cook a specific dish and um, sell my dishes on my blog. Used as help forums, people with common interests can share ideas. So, for example, we started a, a Grady 11 Cat blog and the students could all log in and we could share ideas of the different things we learn in Cat. Used for social change, promote freedom of expression and speech. Just please remember, we've told you before, 
whatever you put out there is out there. You might, you might retract it from yourself, um, from your own device, but once it's been published out there, it takes quite a bit to try and retrieve something off the internet. So take responsibility for what you say and do. WordPress and Blogger host blogs for free. Okay, disadvantages, this is the last bit for today, is must update constantly to maintain interest. If I don't keep updating the YouTube channel, people are going to lose interest. So it's very important that I keep updating with new videos every single day. Responses posted can be worthless. So sometimes people just put a random comment that has absolutely nothing to do with the blog. So you will still have to read through it and then decide whether or not you want to respond. Constant display of advertisements in free sites. So you have seen on any free site, every couple, like once a minute, or in your games even, you will see that there is advertising. So this is how they make money, is they will allow other companies to advertise on your blog. Posting appear from newest to oldest. So quite often, if you are looking for a specific um, blog that was written a year ago, you would have to actually go through all of the posts until you found the one that you're looking for. If the, the person with the blog um, is wise, they would actually put a, a search bar in onto their website so that you would be able to search for a specific um, blog. Okay, we are going to stop there today. Um, we will continue next time again. Part two will start with the software for physically challenged users. It's a very important section. Um, and we will it's actually, no, I'm actually going to continue now. It's only a very short section. Um, so let's see if we can, we've got time here. Okay, people with physically, physical disabilities such as poor eyesight, blindness, deafness, or even problems with motor function, so uh, motor neuron diseases, um, they are still able to use a computer. Operating systems contain settings and utilities to help make the computer easier for, for people with disabilities. So let us take a look at the different options. So in your control panel, there is a section called ease of access. Here, let the window suggest settings so you can specify what you need. Optimize visual display, so maybe make it brighter, make it bigger. Uh, re replace sounds with visual cues. So for example, instead of the computer beep, it might flash something on the screen. Change how your mouse works, okay? Um, that your mouse is used for more features, maybe use it as an online keyboard, the screen. Also, you could possibly use sticky keys um, so that if I repeatedly press the same key over and over, it will come up with a message saying, would you like to create a sticky key? So sticky key is used for if someone's got minimal movement and they can only access certain keys on the computer or on the keyboard, they will press, for example, S for save and maybe um, N for new and they, they could create sticky keys to help people with disabilities. Okay, so let's see. I can have a magnifier um, magnifying an area on the screen. So there is a setting on your computer that you can actually open a magnifier and take it over the screen and in large parts of the screen. Text to speech, this is probably one, one of the most important. Even an able-bodied person can use text to speech while driving. I can listen to a book and a change, set my, my ebook text to speech, and it will read the book to me. So I can continue reading my book while I'm in the car. I don't actually have to take my eyes off the road. Making the mouse cursor larger so it's easier for them to see. Higher contrast settings are easier to read. So um, maybe 
a black font against a light background. This is something when you set up your website, you are going to have to pay attention to. Uh, displaying visual notices instead of sound. And sticky keys, slokes, keys, or non-screen display of non-alphabetical characters. Speech recognition for voice control. So I can say to my computer, open word. And we have a lot of um, online assistants like Siri. Um, I can't remember exactly all the different ones right now, but you can actually give vo voice um, uh, instructions and it will then open the software for you. Okay, sticky keys. Um, use keyboard shortcuts or type capital letters without pressing more than one key at a time. Uh, slow keys inserts a short pause between the press of a key and the display of the letter. And you can set it up with the ease of access. Okay, so then there is a section there you can turn on sticky keys. Otherwise, what you can do is just press a key repeatedly and it will ask if you want to create a sticky key for that specific letter. Okay, many companies design software with features similar to those built into the operating system. These programs improve upon uh, what the operating system offers, like iListen or Speech Plus. There are many apps available on your cell phone and tablets that will give you text to speech. So a camera tracking where software tracks your head movement. So say I was in an accident or something and I'm in a wheelchair. So I can use different features where it can actually, the camera will track my eye movement to see where I'm looking. Um, and it will then use the mouse will be linked to that and then I will be actually, without moving my hands, I will be able to um, control the computer with that. Okay, Magic Software. Magic Software is uh, the Magic Screen Magnification Software. is an example of software that increases the size of what is seen and can read it aloud with the synthesizer. So it's useful for those with low vision. Okay, that is all for today. That is the whole of module 1.4 software. Um, I would like you to summarize this section in your books or you can do it electronically. Um, if you do it in your books, please take a photo and post it on Google Classroom. Um, otherwise, OneNote, Google Docs, um, there, there's a new thing I learned about is uh, Google Jamboard. I'm going to try and find some information on that and share that with you so that you can try that out. Um, so please complete the written module activity. Thank you very much for uh, joining me today. I hope you have learned a few new things and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.